My name is Leah Weens, and I am um, just transitioning out of my role as the Director of Engagement for the Sport for Life Society, and I'm moving into a role at the Repsol Sports Center um, as Sport Director there. So that's the, formerly the Talisman Center, for those of you who are familiar with Calgary facilities. And uh, so I'm really excited about being able to kind of merge those two roles today, actually, and help to host this webinar, which has come about um, as a result of many, I guess everywhere I go and everyone I talk to talks about parents as either the missing link, the problem, we need to talk to parents, parents need to be engaged, but in all of the work that I've seen across the country, I don't really think that anyone, and you guys hopefully can correct me if I'm wrong, has done a really good job of being able to do that as effectively as we need to in order to help advance physical literacy and quality sport in our country. So I think Today we're really excited about sharing some research with you and some best practices and help to plant some seeds so that hopefully we can all share and work together with one another to really um, leverage what parents can do to help their own children and help hopefully the whole movement of sport and physical, physical literacy across our country. And so today we have myself doing a bit of the presentation and we also have Dr. Vicki Harbour with the Sport for Life Society um, and Alberta Sport Connection. We also have Richard Monet from Active for Life and we have Lynn Job who will also be helping out from Active for Life which she will be helping to um, answer some questions as well. And so uh, just a, a bit of a preliminary information if we, so you have these right at your fingertips, it's just some different websites for you to access for more information. And uh, another one that we didn't mention here, it would be the John O'Sullivan Changing the Game um, website and workshop as well. Um, he's doing some really great work, um, not only in the United States, but in Canada and across the country. And we would have a, a short reference to that later on as well. Uh, but definitely these sites you have in front of you are excellent sources of information for parent education, quality sport, active living, physical literacy, uh, all things movement uh, and quality related. So. Um, maybe we'll move on to the next slide and just talk about uh, one more piece of information because we talk a lot about communication and consistent communication and Richard is going to share the amazing resources on the Active for Life website later on and we wanted to kind of sandwich that with some other resources that Participation has put together as a result of the National Physical Literacy Alliance in Canada and so if you click on the link at the bottom of this slide when you get your slide deck sent to you uh, you will be able to see a suite of um, promotional, um, I guess, images that you can use in your marketing and your promotion education tools, as well as some messaging that we've, we've all come together and felt that really summarize the key components of physical literacy specifically. So one more thing before I hand it over to Dr. Vicki Harbour, uh, some of you may be coming from, you know, more of a sports specific background, some of you may be coming from more of a you know, recreation background, even though we don't like to split the two, and we know that those are all on a continuum and there's lots of overlap. And so the messages today, uh, you know, there's some common pieces that will apply or you may, you may want to adapt, but we, we feel like the information here really is, is broadly applicable across all, I guess, age groups across the lifespan around uh, physical literacy and, and engaging those parent communities. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Vicki to uh, tell us more. Thanks, Leah. Uh, that's great. Welcome, everybody. And uh, so the first thing I'm actually going to get you to do is to include in your question box that's on your side panel is to address this question just in your own way about, you know, why do you think parents get their kids involved in sport and physical activity? So if you could just start populating that in the question box, I just would like to sort of see what your thoughts are around why do parents think sport and physical activity, uh, those kinds of movement experiences are good for their children? What might be some of the reasons behind it? So I'll give you about uh, 30 seconds just to start throwing some of those answers in there. And Tyler, I'm not sure if you're seeing something. I'm I'm not seeing anything yet, and maybe that's just a quiet crowd on on Monday. No, it's looking like we're getting a lot of comments in the questions pane, which is great. 
also see a, a few people with their hands up. Because we have so many people on this call, if you have any questions, if you could please put them in the question pane, we'll address them that way. Um, but yeah, we're getting some great responses, so some of the answers so far, we've got uh, enjoyment, belief and benefits for health and socialization, to burn energy, because it's a sport the parent plays or participated in, because everyone else is doing it, trying to give the best foundation for a productive life, healthy lifestyle, social engagement, keeps them busy, to be with friends, long-term health and socialization, sense of community, fitness and friends, to have fun, all sorts of great responses, building friendships. We can we can compile all of these comments from the audience and share this as part of the um, package that we share afterwards with the recording in the slide deck, but a lot of good responses in here. Oh, that's wonderful. Un unfortunately, for some reason, I, I can't see those, uh, but um, nevertheless, thank you for reading those out, Tyler. So again, I think m most of those answers that Tyler read out have certainly touched on the, the reasons behind, the, the various reasons. It's not often one neat and tidy kind of reason why we do get our, not only our, our children, but in fact ourselves involved in sport and physical activity. Everything from the social, the physical, uh, some of the psychological benefits, and increasingly I think we're really starting to understand the need for this social connection through sport and physical activity as well as some of those performance parameters. And when Leah mentioned that how we deal with sport and other physical activity experiences, this is where I honestly believe where we have very common ground is that this creation of a sense of belonging is that regardless of how we are active, how we move our bodies, whether it's in a sport context, whether it's in a recreation context, whether it's in a a free play or leisure context, regardless of, of those different environments, there is this common thread of creating a sense of belonging and why we do it is what also brings that uniqueness to it around creating a common place for us to create social cohesion and have those experiences from that. In the next two blocks that I'm actually just going to share with you are some of the wonderful learnings we've had from a Canadian researcher around understanding more about the role of parents in supporting their child's journey in quality sport, physical literacy, quality physical activity experiences. I'm going to first tell a bit of a story about Louise Humbert. She's a professor at the University of Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan's been doing some marvelous work around their partners for physical activity and through a community initiatives fund, they too were very curious about the relationship that parents would have on behalf of their children in making selections about physical literacy in particular and helping them understand more to evolve and amplify that all-important relationship between child and parent. In their preliminary questionnaire, they found out that really parents really hadn't heard much about physical literacy really quite important and also judge that their children were physically literate. Uh, parents also felt that uh, they were an important or an integral role, most importantly in developing physical literacy in their children. Parents, they found out through the questionnaire, they want support for this, so they don't want to ride this on a solo point of view, but they want support. They value schools and the physical education opportunities that are provided. And then a fifth finding they came out from this survey and questionnaire was that they want the community to provide opportunities at a reduced cost, more opportunities to be active with a provision of quality coaches or instructors. So these were really, again, you know, starting with understanding the audience. So that was an important set of information they came out with. This question they then posed was, who do you think has the primary responsibility for helping children develop physical literacy? Would you say it should be parents, schools, communities, or other? Well, this really made Louise and her colleagues quite surprised because 88% of the respondents reported that parents have the primary responsibility for helping their child develop physical literacy. And you can see the smaller numbers, 7% thought schools, 2% communities, and 3% reported other, which included everything from all of the above, some type of chief within um, 
uh, uh, different lands and role and also the importance of role models. So in starting this again it really echoed the important role of parents not only in support but also in what kinds of actions they can be provided with. So they came up with this dream team project and this is going to be our first wash at what are some of the things that they have tested and put out there that have, might have some type of positive impact in their audience. So this dream team project, 12 week program which was both intervention and program, they had some practice sites capturing both small and urban, they ran a pre and post assessment using some of the sport for life play tools, post interviews with both parents and teachers. For the home part of this, again it was, a, it was an integrative kind of uh, intervention, they created these backpacks filled with different little bits of equipment and ideas written up on cards sent home once a week including things like the Active for Life cards, they had a resource, a play resource from Blue Cross and some ideas for how to use the equipment which included some valuable learning cues, games, actual on the ground kind of how to. In the school setting they created 25 lesson plans linked to the schools or to the province's curriculum with a physical literacy focus. And then the third layer of this intervention program was that in the community they created physical literacy nights. The preliminary findings that they've come out, and this is a, an ongoing project, but this was after uh, their first go-round, is that teachers greatly appreciated the lessons that explicitly showed how to develop physical literacy. Secondly, the backpacks were just an outstanding hit. In fact, they were shocked at how you know, the kids were absolutely chomping at the bit to get their backpacks filled with the next week's activities. They were thrilled by them. And when asked, most children reported playing with the equipment daily. And I think that's a, that's a real key part. The kids were excited, they were motivated by it. And on the other side of it, they were actually using it. And the community nights became better attended as the project progressed. Children loved playing with their parents. And I think this is another echo point here that children love to be doing these things with their parents and so um, sometimes we all know that when parents come to uh, either drive their children to sport or physical activity experiences the parents become the sedentary spectators and yet in these instances it was really trying to groom that parent-child relationship and the child's <laughs> the kids were said to be trying really hard to get mums and dads um, off the benches to participate. And one of the, the greatest points was that Louise had noted one of these classic examples through these community nights and in combination with the backpack with these very easy to follow instructions was that parents could come out with, and this was one quote, I taught my son how to throw. Want to see? And so the parents felt incredibly valued and part of the child's journey. So it wasn't the, the parent continuing to be a spectator, watching the child learn new things and experiencing those things. It really involved the parent. So I think this is a, one of our first lessons when we start to realize the value of parents, the essential role that parents play in a child's life. So that's again a real snapshot of Louise's work. Now I'm actually going to cross over to Wales. And the young woman that you see up in the top right corner, Camilla Knight, um, I got to know when she was doing her PhD at the University of Alberta. Uh, one of the sharpest cookies around, I tell you, and she's been devoting her whole research life around engaging parents in sport. Now we're going to kind of flip this more to a sport focus, but I don't want you to lose sight of those early pieces we talked about, parent engagement the relationship between parent and child because you're, you're going to see in a minute I'll be in a different context, different environment. It's equally important. So Camilla is at Swansea University and she does work with Sport Wales and they have really been looking at the role of parents in sport. In fact this last October 2017 they actually dedicated an entire week to parents in sport week and Camilla has produced uh, some wonderful information not only at the research level but in a very friendly 
easy to digest kind of fashion for parents, coaches, sport groups, schools, and so on. So again, I'm going to just kind of give you some high level pieces that I think will give us all some concrete places to start. This webinar, uh, by the way, is available and it's another website or web link that we will provide for you in the final printout. So Camilla provided a 45 minute webinar on this which can be uh, streamed, no cost, combined with a downloadable PDF of her, her notes and so on. So in honoring Camilla's work on this, I've, I've really just done a copy and paste to show some of the marvelous things she's been doing. So again, asking for input from the group first of all now. So I want you to kind of put your that, that sport thinking hat on. We understood in the beginning, why do you get your kid involved in sport and quality physical activity? Now I want you to think a little bit more directly at the role of the parent. So if you think about supporting a child's physical literacy journey, whether it's in all kinds of activity experiences, whether it's in the sport environment, I'd like you to spend uh, about 30 seconds here populating that chat box or question box. Identify the roles of parents. What roles do parents play in supporting their child's physical literacy journey, their role in sport? So hopefully that's clear to you. And if I could ask uh, Tyler again just to monitor that, what are the roles that parents play? Yeah, so Vicki, we had a question a moment ago from Rob. He was asking you to speak to the role, uh, where to go here, speak to about parents who engage their children in sport by living vicariously through their child. He experienced a lot of this at the uh, weekend national championships in Edmonton. Holy cow. Yeah, just, uh, man, that, uh, that really rings very true. And I think there is this issue that contributes towards the challenges that we have in working with parents, particularly in those sport environments where those are a wonderful selection of words around parents living vicariously as if their, their child's performances and achievements are directly related to the parent's sense of self-worth and self-esteem. So perhaps if I can just hold off answering on that because I think the next little bit here might start to address some of the issues underlying why does that happen. And if, and if we haven't nailed it by then, let's make sure that, that we leave with some clarity around that. So hopefully that's, that's a, a, a suitable place for us um, to hold on to that because that's a very challenging area. And other than that, we're getting a lot of uh, similar responses from our audience. Uh, parents should be supporters, they should be positive, they should be mentors role models, uh, role models by being active, cheerleader comes up often, uh, being a coach, a volunteer, leading by example, important for parents not to get involved in the sport themselves. Um, so these are a lot of the, the themes that are coming up. Excellent, supporting, excellent. Supporting our kids by driving them to and from practice. Yep. Yeah, getting involved with the board, assistant coach, administration, setting boundaries around screen time, nutrition, activity, and many more responses here that again we'll summarize and send out to everybody, but uh, this is great. Thank you very much. For oh, this yeah, my goodness. Isn't it just, I mean, just hearing that, isn't it a, a wealth of all of these things that, that we have ideas that parents are directly responsible for? So what Camilla has done in her uh, over time is that yes, we understand you know parents have to pay the pay the fees. They do have to drive their kids. They have to be the time manager, getting them there, picking them up from there. That piece around support, that loving unconditional support, uh, you know, they're the the food cook and washer, including dirty laundry, and helping above all make choices. Um, and that again, that's not exhaustive, but I but I wanted to mirror back some of the points that you had had raised very nicely with within the uh, chat panel. What Vicky, can I'm you... just going to jump oh. in for a second, sure. sorry, yeah. Yeah, again. And um, Maxwell had a question or comment that we may want to just consider as well was around um, some parents have a sports background and some do not and sometimes there's a disconnect between those parents and so how do we either connect them or get them onto the same page. So something else to kind of keep in mind. 
Yeah, and if, if I can, uh, just some clarification is that those parents that have had a connection with sport or their own experience in sport, is that, um, is the question about how do we how do we uh, work with those parents and and do we work with those parents differently than those parents who have not had those similar experiences? If we could add some um, clarity to that, that that would certainly help create some discussion around that. Um, and I'm okay. sorry that I'm not sure why I'm not seeing the questions. You're still not seeing it? No, no. Which is uh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh I think it was more around, you know, you've got this, and Max, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that you've got probably a, a continuum of those parents that you would have in a group or a team or, right, and so, you know, I guess maybe does the messaging need to be different? Do we need to get everyone on the same page? How do we, do we have different mm -hmm. strategies for working with parents who have more background than others? That's, that's how I would interpret it, but we'll see yes. if Max yep. adds to that. Yep. We'll yes, and, and I... And parents and where do you draw the line? Right, right. And I would say at face value, the, the, the uh, relationship that we create with parents, the partnership that we create with parents, regardless of what their sport background is, gosh, what their academic background is, what their financial or economic wealth background is, what I'm understanding from Camilla's work is that we're all in this together and that uh, if we understand first and foremost not so much what the parent brings to the sport environment but coming at it more from what are the roles that parents play with their child's um, life growth and development and so the, it, this work with Camilla has really altered the way I've thought about coaching in the years that I was coaching youth soccer here in Edmonton for about 12, almost 14 years, I understand uh, how parents, again, have been portrayed as these, you know, voracious, vicarious individuals that when we start talking about parents, we collectively roll our eyes and kind of fasten our seat belts to get, oh, brace yourself now, we've got to deal with parents again. So it's got a very negative climate to it. And so what Camilla has tried to portray is coming back in her really growing and extensive work is let's pull back for a minute and come at this from a more understanding and values based around the critical role that parents play. So, and, and, and these are not sort of one-time conversations and I'm, ter I'm hugely assuming that this really launches more conversations which is a lot about what we're at and around sport for life and active for life is hearing more from individuals about how we can continue these conversations, learn more, try new things. So let's let's kind of come back to this because I'm just I'm sensitive to time. So in all the in answers that you had provided, Camilla has categorized these into three different areas. The first one on the left is about, yes, you are the provider. You provide the money, you provide the, the driving, you provide food, you provide um, uh, directions around decision making. The middle one and the third one are ones that we really do not address that much and how this might influence that parent relationship in sport. So the first one is the interpreter. And so how a parent interprets a situation. So, for example, if a parent thinks that there's been a, a travesty on, on the play field and they feel that the referee calls have been completely unfair, unfairly applied to their child, to their team, how the parent interprets that is a direct uh, learning opportunity and experience for that child. So if you can imagine well, again, with the Edmonton Oilers, who just played uh, not last night's game, but the game before where they felt the referees were completely ignoring goaltending. So if you imagine adults up in the crowd saying, oh, those refs stink, they don't know what they're doing, they're favoring the Ducks, the child who is in that situation relies on that parent's interpretation of the world. And it doesn't take much for the, parent, for the child to 
learn from the parent in how they interpret the world around what is fair, what is not fair. The child will pick that up. And the third part is intricately connected to how the parent interprets then is how does the parent then act? So yes, we can have parents that think that referees are unfair in their decisions, yet then we start to see a range of behaviors. What actions then does the parent portray? Do they kind of sit quietly and go, oh man, that was an awful call. And we, then we also have parents acting out, standing up in the stands, shaking their fist, flipping the middle finger, screaming obscenities. And we know that that has been even gone to further extremes where parents actually wait for the referee at the end of the game to threaten and influence saying, you know, you are a terrible referee and so on. So that role modeling behavior is a complete extension of how the parent has interpreted that, all of which the child takes in. So if we understand then that these are critical roles and how can we support parents in their roles as providers, interpreters and role models, we start to see things differently. And it's not for one minute at all to cave or to uh, succumb to those unacceptable uh, actions or behaviors that emerge. But if we start to understand that is part of the role of the parent. So many times this is what we jump to. We start thinking that um, in fact, that, that top left living through their child, I mean, that's, that's the vicarious one, is that as coaches um, or people who are managing sport and physical activity environments, is this really what we are pigeonholing parents into? Oh, sorry. And then, but parents are important and must be valued. So instead of this kind of, um, you know, this whole approach of, oh man, this difficult, difficult role. If we think that parents are a necessary evil, it carries with it an ignoring of the value that they bring to their child's sport life. So Camilla's work is predicated on this. And she now is building some concrete tools as to how to alter the way in which we work with parents. In fact, she has stopped using the language around parent education in the same sentence. Because even when parents will hear the word about parent education, their backs can get stiff and they think, oh, you know, don't tell me how to parent my child and being educated. As opposed to this language around, it's an engagement, it's a partnership. And there are two things, and I'm only going to get into one of these, is that it's essential for parents to understand their child as an individual. And many times, sport in particular portrays this global pathway, these global opportunities that seduce parents into thinking uh, more about these global aspirations as opposed to what does their child need? What does my child need when they are four years old, when they are six years old, when they are eight years old? And stop getting glammed by these um, seductive features being presented by sport. And this all begins with what Camilla calls shared and communicated goals. That even the youngest of child of children can can help explain what they wish to gain out of a particular physical activity or sport experience. So I'm going to hand this part over to Leah because she's got going on at Repsol right now an example of where some of these finding a different way to uh, engage parents, partner with parents to make those sport and quality experiences what they could be and what they should be for our children. Leah, right. over to you. Thanks, Vicki. And, and I'm sure that there are many more examples and I've been um, keenly uh, watching and reading all of the great information that's being shared on the chat bar question box. So hopefully, Vicki, you are able to see that because there's some, some great examples there. And uh, so this is just one example and it's um, it came about as a part of an RBC Learn to Play 
grant that we got um, that we got before I was at Rexall Sports Center, um, but as the mentor from Canadian Sport for Life, I was able to um, help kind of frame and structure this project a little bit. And so part of it is, and I won't spend a lot of time on this piece, but you know, before we engage the parents, I really wanted to make sure um, that all of the staff at the Repsol Sports Center were informed about physical literacy and about quality sport and using that language because once we, you know, making sure we have that baseline will help then when they're speaking with the parents and parents are hearing and seeing similar messaging, similar types of programming best practices um, throughout the or promising practices um, across the facility. And so we actually brought together uh, people from the aquatics, the lead managers and staff in two separate um, workshops from the aquatics area, the communications area, finance, customer service, right, they're the front line. We want them to be really um, informed about the potential and, and give guidance to those parents, uh, the sport and fitness department managers and staff. So, um, so we really tried to get that knowledge and, and over the past few months of kind of talking to those staff and seeing them kind of apply that has been really quite interesting, where before it was really more focused in the sport department, I would say, and not as broad across the facility. So we want each department to kind of tinker with, with this and the ideas. We didn't give them a lot of direction. We wanted them to kind of see how this would fit into their current programming and support their current programming and offering. And then we're going to follow up with that um, and bring them all back together to share what they're learning and how they see this being built and, and how we can now really take this out more into the parent audience and, and communicate that and deliver that to our programs. And then we also want to send all of our department leads or one or two people from each department to our physical literacy superhero training where they'll attend with other leaders across the city and learn about physical literacy, confidence, confidence and motivation and how, um, how that can and how they can then tr train their staff. So I think that was just a piece we really wanted to to do before we engage parents and some of you may already have that done and have that down pat um, and so you know just to continue with that but if you want to move to the next slide Vicki I'll tell you a little more about our parent piece so we're moving into uh, training or not training working with parents and, and taking this whole idea of parents being celebrated leveraging parents as a resource as an, as an asset and one of the things that comes to my mind a lot is, and one of the things that really um, frustrates me, I guess, is when I see, you know, these parents who are volunteering their time, maybe as a board member, or they're bringing their kids to the rink, and I, I'm a, I have kids in hockey, so I'll use a hockey example, where the kids normally have to be at the rink at least, you know, 30 minutes, if not an hour before their game or practice, and most of the time, parents will come, um, drop their kids off, and then stay at the rink and visit, but they're not being active they're sitting they're sedentary and so to me i think you know would we be better off to use that time to go for a walk to take care of yourself and that will that make you you know a greater role model for your child rather than sitting at the arena all the time of course we want to watch our kids at a certain point but we also want to take care of ourselves so it's kind of like the oxygen mask on the airplane where you put on your child first or you put on yourself first, sorry, and then on your child so that you can be a better support for your child. And so one of the things with this Repsol project was instead of sort of lecturing to the parents and having another workshop and having another session where we're, you know, trying to get parents out and it's often the parents who already get it that are there and sure they become better champions for us um, and have that messaging. But we don't get, you know, parents who may not, who may be apathetic, who may just drop their kids off and leave, who, you know, might, um, you know, just trust that, hey, everything's great and, and aren't really embracing their role um, to support their children and to be more wise consumers of sport and physical activity programs. And so we want to start by celebrating the parents first. And so we're looking at a bit of an incentive program around how can we um, help parents maybe use the facility more while they're at their kids or the kids are being active. So we're starting with a survey on the main on the weekend. We're doing a family day um, and we're going to survey the parents and find out a lot more, not just what they do about the facility, but how do they select activities for their children, starting to plant some seeds without being too sort of luxury and in your face and more supportive, right? How can we help you kind of approach? Um, and then from there, we want to create a parent strategy, which could include activities for parents that coincide with their activity, uh, more training, 
for our staff, as I mentioned, um, ongoing advice about how parents can support their child's journey, whether they are, we have a dual mandate at the Repsol Sports Center, so whether it's, um, you know, participation, um, activity-based, or whether it, they're in one of the sport club programs and, and a more sport-specific journey, how can they support that? Um, we will offer different workshops depending on interest that direct kind of email messaging and then some different maybe incentives around attending workshops to help um, in, empower the parents more. And then we really want to integrate that into our uh, summer camps and fall programs coming up. So that's kind of the idea. And if you go to the next slide, Vicki, um, the reason we took this approach was because I've been doing this work in, in Cochrane where I live, we've had, um, parent sessions, we've, had, we've been really fortunate to have a lot of great leaders in our community and we've had the level of, of workshops and quality of presenters including, you know, Vic, Dr. Vicki Harbour, including John O'Sullivan, including Steve Norris, including, you know, you could get the list goes on and on and on. And we have these amazing speakers and presenters that come out and will struggle and pound the pavement to get 10 people or 20 people or 50 people to come out to a workshop. So people are not necessarily valuing it but when they come they always appreciate it right so I've come to a bit of the conclusion that and Vicki's and the research kind of supports that is that you know just having workshops and throwing information out there isn't necessarily gonna gonna make the change and one more thing around that is just recently I have heard you know and I, maybe it's a challenge out there but I know Hockey Calgary and Hockey in, in, in Canada we have the respect in sport course and so we have parents who must attend um, this or take this online course and now the parents are having to renew it every four years and so the question that was brought up in my mind was what's going on to support that right so are we just saying hey do this online course and you know now parents will know how to behave in the stands or they'll be able to know how to support their children right and I know I'm not you know I know that the Husky Calgary and other associations are, are, are engaged and they want to support parents but I think it needs to be a full parent engagement strategy and a cultural shift that permeates throughout an organization or throughout a facility and you know we can't just host a workshop put some information up and think that we've done our job right and so I think that that's where that's where really it's going so I'm challenging you today I guess to you know how do you create that overall engagement strategy you know we're putting some resources together making it a priority that ongoing communication that Vicki talked about and using all of the research that we have so far in order to do that. And I think, you know, no matter where a child or a parent is on the continuum, if it comes down to open communication and um, just, just being, you know, being, helping them to be advocates with the most appropriate information. So with that said, then let's move on to the next slide. And we if, go ahead. If Leah, if I could just add in there, because you 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 mentioned something so important there around this cultural shift, is that in order for any organization, whether it's in a sport club, whether it's in a school or a rec center, the idea that if we really want to value the contributions of parents, it needs to appear within one's strategic plan within. Uh, actual on the ground pieces and I did read in the in the question box around sometimes parents don't want to be engaged and yet this I think becomes the opportunity for all of us to look at if we value their contribution how can we go about that you know how can we really demonstrate and and put it into our day-to-day -day practices and programs to demonstrate its value to to everyone so I'm going to hand this back to you, Leah. That's great. Thank you. And just a quick comment here, and then we'll get, we'll get over to Richard's um, presentation as well. Someone asked about the parent who's, you know, working two jobs and just dropping their, kid, their child off. And I think, I think we have to respect that. And we don't, have, we don't put expectations on our parents. We empower those parents. And we say, you know, that mom might need some extra help. And maybe it, it is more about you know, helping her get up for a 15-minute walk at lunch so she's not so stressed or whatever it might be, right? So I think you're right. I think it's it's not it's naive to think that we're going to have every parent, you know, signing up to be a board member and signing up to be a coach. And frankly, we don't want that, right? We want parents to even just be those role models at home. And, and if their child brings home, 
you know, some physical literacy homework, if uh, that would ever happen, right? Hey, I want to kick the ball, I want to practice my throwing, whatever it might be that, you know, you were able to spend that five or ten minutes doing that. So I think it could be as simple as, you know, playing for five minutes with your child to, you know, being the chair of the board or being the coach, right? So I think it's meeting where they're at. Leah? Sorry, yeah. when I just that that was such an important point that came out around engaging parents is not synonymous with asking them to do more. Um, right. That idea that parents are wicked busy, and you're right. Whether it's single parent homes, you know, uh, double parent homes, whatever the situation is with financial stresses and time, the purpose of this engagement piece. I'm going to bring us back to the idea of shared and communicated goals between parent and child. And this, in fact, is really establishing such a precious environment between parent and child, which at face value, engaging parents isn't asking them to become the statistician for the team, to become a board member. This is really about harnessing uh, and reminding parent and child the value of their relationship and how that can grow through quality sport, through the child's physical literacy journey. So I think it's, I'm so glad that came up because this isn't creating another checklist for parents. Yeah, exactly. That's great. Uh, so one of the pieces that came out of the John O'Sullivan, I guess, blog and post in his network was, was this resource that you have Tyler's included it in the handout section, and Vicky's going to show it now. Um, and it's it's around, you know, how do we start off the season? And and this is a, for sure sport specific, but you could take this idea and apply it to a recreation program, which we probably never do. Do we sit down with our parents at the start of a learn to skate program, at the start of a, you know, whether it's gym and swim, whatever that program might be? There's some opportunities here, I think, to take this idea and and you could tweak it, right? So. This was created, this handout was created so that you can use this or share it with your coaches or with your leaders as a process for them to be able to have a really powerful conversation and, and help the parents start to feel engaged. If you're asking parents expectations, um, but it gives you guidance on how to manage that conversation because we're not all experts in, I know, psychology. We're not all experts in communication and dealing with conflict, et cetera, right? So this is a way to uh, pose some questions and just start a dialogue in a really positive way. Um, so you can see through, and Vicki's just scrolling through, and, and you can take some time to look at this afterwards, but write a measurable goal you have for your child, a goal for the team, and a goal for yourself. Um, and we also have then what, what do you want your child's experience to be if they can't accomplish the goal you wrote for them or the team or on the card, right? So very um, intriguing types of questions that can help parents really start to think a little bit differently, maybe, or maybe just reinforce some of their um, their ideas. Because for the most part, more, all our parents, we want our kids to be happy, healthy, and successful, right? Sometimes we just d differ in how we want to go about that, and uh, we want to try to help support one another. What do you want your experience as a, to be like as a sport parent? How many parents actually think about that? And if they did, what would they answer? How do you help create that experience for other parents, putting responsibility on other parents to help create that experience? And we know if we're involved or if we're having the positive experience, our, most likely our children are as well. And then what can the, what can the coaches do? So if you, if you um, scroll down a little bit more, there's some feedback. Or actually, let's go back to the slides, Vicki. I'm just conscious of the time here. Um, but do take a look, and you will get that. You will, we did it without logos purposely so that you could take that and adapt it. You can read the full article on the blog uh, yourself so that you get a really good insight into how that information was used and the, the success that so the coach had with that. So if we go to that next slide, Vicki. Oh, I thought there was one more of that. Oh, sorry. It's in the handouts that you'll get, the extra slides that Tyler talked about, um, where it talks about the feedback that they got from the parents around that. And it was all very positive and very insightful of what um, the coaches and the parents who went through that process together actually experienced. So do take a look at that. And, um, and you know, like I said, do, do, I do challenge you to start thinking broader about that parent engagement and really making it a priority and then using this great network. We have 113 people here, so obviously it's an interesting topic. We spent 
I think, three to four months of long-term athlete development lunches in Alberta with uh, provincial sport organizations on this topic, and they just kept wanting more and more of it. So we know that there's an interest out there and an appetite, but now it's a matter, I think, of how do we do this in a in an intentional and effective way. So um, with that being said, I want to pass it over to Richard, and um, as we're doing a transition there, if there's any other questions in the chat box, we can answer those. Or Vicky, if you have any other comments, while Richard's flipping over. Yeah, I think. Um... That's Richard's, just as he just gets ready there, I think this launches a completely different kind of conversation and uh, these things don't happen overnight, but I know for me personally, um, when I read through that article and when you go to the website, you'll actually see some of the parent comments, the responses, and it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a humanizing experience, if I can put it in that language. So. It's, it's wonderful to be able to address this ongoing or this perpetual issue with parents in a very different kind of way. So, Richard, over to you. Hi, everyone. Well, this was uh, really great to listen to uh, Leah and Vicky uh, present this information. Um, I don't know if, if you know about Active for Life, but Active for Life was uh, created, whoops, Sorry, I'm going to change my slide. The second year, difficulties. Let me try this again. There we go. So, um, <clears throat> Active for Life was created. First of all, we're a not-for-profit organization. We're actually a uh, parent organization of a charity, a privately funded charity. And Active for Life came from sport. Um, Active for Life is funded by B210, and B210's purpose is to help Olympians, Canadian Olympians, win medals for Canada, which is really focused on a very small part of the sport and physical activity sector in Canada. But what we realize is that if helping athletes win medals is one thing, but it's not really helping most kids get active, physically literate, and moving. So back in 2011, we, um, B210 decided to start Active for Life. And what we saw at that time, so again, I'm going back to 2011, the end of 2011, what we saw at that time is there were a lot of organizations that were emerging, like, like Sport for Life, for example, that were doing amazing work trying to create what we call the new normal. The new normal is when every kid in this country and every person in this country is developing physical literacy through life and more kids are involved in sport, more kids are active and everyone is, is out here because of it. So a lot of organizations were working from the top down. Um, the best example was Aki Canada, uh, the NEL TAD that they developed in collaboration with Sport for Life and you know from the top down Aki Canada was, was trying to, to spread physical literacy in the LTAD model all the way to the base. But of course, because the effort was top down, a lot of work was being done at the top and very little information and actually actual change happened at the grassroots. So what we decided to do at Active for Life was to support this grassroots and, and engage the grassroots. And there's two key concepts here that, that we, um, we've used over the years. The first one is gatekeepers. And when you think about parents mostly and teachers and activity leaders and coaches, we call these the gatekeepers of kids' activities. So they're the decision makers. Parents decide what activity their kids will do. Uh, coaches decide, uh, coaches and programs and, and, and organizations decide what program will be delivered, how it will be delivered, etc. So what we're trying to do is really engage these and then support these gatekeepers into providing in as many different ways as possible, ways to develop physical literacy in children and also deliver quality sports so children stay active for their entire life. We also call this grassroots the quiet majority. And this is to connect with everything that Vicky and Leah have said about parents. I heard the, I, I, the first time I heard the concept quiet majority was at the uh, Sport for Life um, uh, International Physical Literacy Conference in Banff in 2013. I, I listened uh, to um, about a presentation about respect and sport 
and um, Leah, can you help me? Who, who's the uh, main uh, person that uh, Sheldon Candy used the word "quiet majority"? And and when he used that word, it really piqued my interest. And what Sheldon was trying to explain is that most parents, the quiet majority of parents, want to do the right thing. They want to do it the right way, and they will behave. So what respect in sport was built on was the concept that if you give this quiet majority the tools the resources and the words to use to actually behave correctly at a hockey game, for example, they will prevail. So that's what we're trying to do at Active for Life is to engage the gatekeepers, the quite majority of parents who want to do the right thing, to do something to help the situation. Now, here's a, here's a couple of facts that I, I, I want to share with you that support everything that has been said so far. We, um, there's a, uh, a Canadian company called Data Science did a survey for Active for Life, and uh, they asked thousands of parents across the country, and this took place in March, so this is brand new information, and they, they, they asked different questions to parents across the country for us. The first thing that they ask is, have you heard of fiscal literacy before? And the outcome, the data, the result was that about 21% of parents, parents have heard about fiscal literacy. Now, this is interesting because when we started the work and back in 2011, another company had done a similar survey. And the number we got then was 1.7%, or about 2%. So since that time, it has grown ten tenfold. There's more and more parents that actually know about physical literacy. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. The same company asked the parents who had never heard about physical literacy, are you interested to learn more? 60% of parents said yes, and 33% of parents said maybe. So parents, more and more parents are getting to know about physical literacy, physical literacy, and those who don't know are interested. When you explain to parents in a simple way what physical literacy is about and now why it's good for kids, they want to know. Now, what's another thing that's really interesting is that the, the uh, survey company presented different factors uh, that could influence the development of children. And they asked parents who never heard about physical literacy, what is the most important factor in the proper positive development of your child? And before hearing about physical li literacy, they rated reading and writing as the most important of five factors and they rated physical literacy as the least important of five different factors and after these parents were informed about physical literacy what is it and why is it good for kids in a very simple way they, they were asked the question again and after being informed they rated physical literacy as the most important factor in their children's development going forward so when they're told Parents get it, but they're not told. That's the other thing that uh, this service identified as well, is that not many of us actually, as in organizations around the, this country, educate parents about physical literacy and the importance of getting kids moving. So the other thing that, that we all know as well is that parents know that their kids are not moving and they need help. And we saw the same thing in this survey. So when asked, do you find it challenging or easy to find ways to get your children physically active? You know, 45% said very challenging. Uh, uh, sorry, 11% said very challenging and 45% said more moderately challenging. So the majority of parents are challenged in, in how to get their kids involved in sport and in physical activity and moving. And of course, when they're, they're presented with the option, if it was simpler, easier, would you do it? They want to do it. So we know that parents are, are interested. We know they want to get engaged. And we also know the survey told us, we, the, these parents were asked, okay, so if you want to learn more, where do you go? Where do you get your information? And most of them go to two places their community or sports center, and the internet. So 
this is the kind of the overall picture that we're dealing with when we're trying to get a parent engaged. They want to know, they get it, they want to get engaged, they want to engage in a positive way, they do need help and support, they need simplicity, and what we've learned at Active for Life over the years is that they will share with other parents. So that's kind of what we're dealing with when we're looking at trying to make physical literacy and quality support the new normal in Canada. So then the question is, how do we create this new normal? Well, these little ray, uh, these little sunshines are your organizations. They're the community centers, the sport organizations across the country. And the one thing that each of these centers have, your power, <laughs> is that you're the connector to many people. You, all these parents that come and drop their kids off or stay or talk to other parents, you are at the center of these activities. You are the, the meeting point. So there is an incredible amount of possibility and capacity there. So the idea is that we need to get more parents to know about physical literacy. And this actually will lead to more programs. Because what happened, what we found out at Active for Life is when parents find things that are good for their kids, they share with other parents through social media, through the internet, through conversation, word of mouth, etc. So the idea is that we need to get more parents to understand it, but we can only do that. If more parents understand, there will be a need for more programs. And you know, I should add more quality programs. But at the same time, these programs are the center of incredible human and social network. And that, this is where we need to use these programs to further educate more parents about physical literacy. So if you, if you, if you follow the logic here, this is kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's the chicken and, and the egg thing. More chicken, more eggs, more eggs, more chicken, right? So let's educate parents, but also, which will bring the need for more programs. And then let's use these programs to educate more parents. Now, if you think about everything that I've said, <clears throat> we've built Active for Life to, to kind of fill all these gaps, these needs that were identified. So I'll read this, but at activeforlife.com, parents, educators, and coaches Coaches will find fun activities, engaging our articles and free resources to get kids active, healthy, and, and happy. So a, a, a few things here. We focus on the gatekeepers, parents, educators, coaches. We focus on fun activities because parents like to engage with their kids, but their kids love when their parents engage with them. Uh, we also share engaging articles, content, because parents learn through stories, not only through facts and very boring presentations, like maybe you find this one something, sometimes, but it's really about engaging, creating a, a story, a narrative around engagement. And it needs to be simple and free, or, or actually low cost. So they will do it, so it will fit in their really busy life. So that's the way we've structured Active for Life. So now we're gonna go to the site, and what I'd like to do is to, um, there we go is to share with you some of the resources that we've built on the site with the specific intent of helping you educate parents so that they actually demand and demand quality programming and that they actually are looking and searching and sharing about your great programs. So there's three elements here that I'm going to present. <clears throat> the first one is um, physical literacy. If you go to this tab, you will find specific resources for parents that you can share with parents. So one thing, you are a program specialist. Uh, you're designing quality programming to engage kids and get, make sure that they, they develop physical literacy and, and they participate in quality sport. You're not content specialist, or s most of you are not, and you're not marketing specialist or anything. So what we're trying to do is to, to, to build resources that you can use easily and simply to educate that. So things like um, we've created a very simple infographic of what is physical literacy and what are the effects on kids and how it works. So these are very, very simple things that you can share with parents. 
that will make them understand, help them understand right away why it matters. And then we've got all kinds of articles like nine ways to talk to your child's physically literate, ten ways raising a physically literate child is like raising a reader, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So resources and, and content. So that's one thing. If you go here, you'll find all, all these resources. The other thing that we've created that you can share with parents is a series of activities. And, and, and it's Vicky that, that, that was sharing with us that it is clear that, par that kids love doing activities with their, their parents. So here, what we've done is we've created a, a database of activities that you can share with parents. And this could be like homework. For example, uh, a kid comes and has a, uh, a swimming lesson, then they can go back home and, and you can give them homework. Uh, something like, okay, tonight or this week, do three activities with your, with your parents. And the way this works is you basically figure out the age of your kid, seven years old, let's say, and you want to develop balance. Then the algorithm will actually sort activities so that it will present all the activities that you can do with a seven-year-old to develop balance, and all of these are designed to be very simple and extremely uh, simple and fun, really. So, and that's the way they look. So, a parent can easily read through this, understand, and really understand the benefits. For example, this activity develops coordination, balances as kids try to walk a straight line on a rope lying on the ground. So, they're very simple, very, very, uh, very much focused on having fun with your child, and they're free. The other thing that we've done is we've developed what we call our pro, pro resources. Um, originally, when we started Active for Life, we focused on parents, and then after a few years in existence, we polled our, our, our audience, our users, and they told us, yeah, 97% of us are parents, which was not surprising. And then we realized 30 to 35% of these parents were also professionals. So what was happening is we weren't attracting only parents, but many parents that were in the sector trying to help their kids, trying in the sector, uh, uh, or in a position that they were able to develop physical literacy and quality support in kids. So we realized we've got many teachers, we've got many uh, early, early childhood educators coming to our website, many coaches, etc. So we started asking this, um, this subsection, uh, this subsegment of our audience, what do you need? And uh, they told us different things. So the first thing they said is that we need lesson plans. So we've developed a series of lesson plans that you can find on, on this resource section. Um, this is really a joint effort. We worked uh, with the 60 Minute Kids Club in developing this section. Uh, for example, the 60 Minute Kids Club developed these amazing videos uh, to help people understand these fundamental movement skills. So this is an assessment. Uh, video where you can actually run the video and it, it shows you four stage of development of capacity uh, of kid balancing. So that gives you an idea of where your kid is if you're a teacher or an indicator in after school program, etc. And then if you, there's also an in instructional video. These are long, a bit longer, so I won't show you, but they explain exactly what balancing is. And uh, then you've got all kinds of different lesson plans that you can use. And these are all free to use, and again, they're designed in a way to be simple, clear. Um, you basically can print these off or pop them up on your um, on your your iPad or your phone, etc. Now, another thing that we've developed as well as many people are telling us, uh, well, I know what I'm doing. I like to be able to make up my own lesson plan. So we've developed what we call a lesson plan builder. So it's just a series of, of steps to follow. You choose your age group. Then you can choose different skills, so dodging, jumping, catching, and throwing. So let's say you want to build a session around these four skills. Then it gives you all kinds of different activities. So in red, we've got the dodging skills, uh, activities for dodging. In yellow, we've got activities for jumping. And in blue, uh, an activity for catching and then throwing. So I've chosen, you can, tell, you can see I've chosen four activities. Then basically, I can look at what I've chosen so far. Uh, I can change the order. I look at the time I have. So this lesson plan should take about 42 minutes. 
And then I can do things like put the organization name, activity leader, so really make this tailored to my needs. And then I can publish the lesson plan. And then the lesson plan that you've just created basically is printable or you can again pop it up on your iPad, etc. So that's another tool that um, this has been extremely popular with all kinds of different professionals. Um, we've put together some modules. Basically, I won't go too much into details there, but <clears throat> these are different modules. For example, summer camp one week, summer camp four weeks, different age groups. So these are an assembly of different lesson plans that you can deliver over a period of time. And the other thing that we realize is that it's great to support professionals in giving them tools you know, for their programs, but we also need to help support organization in spreading the word about physical literacy. And that if we do this, more parents will come to these programs. So we call this section, Grow Your Program by Educating Parents About Physical Literacy. And what you've got here is a series of different tools. One that has been extremely popular is what, is what we call our, our physical literacy postcard. So basically, the challenge I put to my team when we started this program was, you know, most parents, I'll give you an example. At that, at that time, uh, if, you, if you were a hockey parent and you wanted to know about physical literacy, you could go, or the LTAD and physical li literacy, you could go to Hockey Canada's website and you could find a PowerPoint about what is LTAD and physical literacy. The only problem that PowerPoint was four levels that deep into the website, so you had to find it. And then when you got there, it was a 34 slide PowerPoint. So the idea is that most parents will not A, take the time to look for it, or B, could not find it, and C, once they got there, they were a bit overwhelmed by the 34 slides. So what the challenge there was, let's make sure that we can explain to parents what physical literacy is and what matters for children in one postcard. So that's what we created, and you can order this postcard to distribute to parents. You don't need to create it. There's different uh, ways that different images and so on that could fit different time, different situation, different context. So these are free uh, to organizations. Uh, we created a, a web page with an assembly of different activities. So this is an easy way. Um, this is our, our uh, what I showed you earlier infographic and uh, printable, printable articles and then we try also to have fun with parents. Remember one thing that is clear is that parents need help but it needs to be simple. One way of doing this for us is that we've de developed a simple fun quiz where we, questions are asked that are you know a bit in some ways so simple that they are actually funny. It's, for example, this first one, being able to, what is physical literacy? Being able to jump rope and read a book at the same time, being able to skip up, catch, and throw so you can participate in lots of activities with confidence for the rest of your life. So, of course, the, the answer is B, and most parents, even if they don't know about physical literacy, they get it, but the key there is to use fun, uh, simplicity uh, to engage people. So this is available. You can share it to your network, etc. Another activity that is fun uh, that we, has been extremely popular is what we call our fortune teller. So I don't know if you remember playing with, with, with something similar when you were young, but you put it on your fingers and you, and you uh, count numbers and you end up with different activities. So this has been extremely popular for teachers and parents. And, and again, it's the same thing that, that Vicky was talking about this morning, which is Kids love to engage with their parents. So this is another tool that you can find on our website and distribute freely to anyone you want. As well as another thing is we keep talking about our physical literacies like reading and writing. Well, we went one step further and we've developed, uh, sorry, we've developed our bookmark. And the number of schools, and I don't know what's happening in the last few weeks, we've had about 200 schools from the United States asking for these bookmarks. Um, to really make that connection when kids are reading books that their bookmark actually explains about physical literacy. So these are all, all tools that, again, the, the goal here is to enable support 
organizations in spreading the word about physical literacy and quality sport. And the intent, the purpose, the why behind this is that more parents know about why it's good for their kids, the more they will demand, the more they will bring and, and register their kids into these programs. So it's really that, again, that chicken and egg thing. We need more programs and we need more parents to educate, to be educated and engaged and, and, and made, help to understand that it's simple, it's easy, it's not cumbersome to get your kid physically literate and engaged in physical literacy and quality sport. So, uh, just a few examples of how we make, I told you about our, I told you about our postcards. I really think as, as organizations, think about how you talk to parents. Um, tell them stories. They want to read, they want to learn through stories. They don't want to learn through very complicated messaging. They want simple, clear, enjoyable, fun stories. Um, allow for different voices. One thing we realize, I mean, my, I live and breathe sport. I, my life has been dedicated to sport. Our team at Active for Life, there's many people that, are, that would call themselves sporty, but one thing we, under, we understood early is that we need to allow for different voices. You know, kids moving can come in many shape and form. So things like, you know, ballet and boys, toddlers at, at circus school, tips for non-sporty parents. Try to, to, to broaden your horizon, make sure that you speak the language of the people but also make the story interesting, intriguing, help people, you know, go beyond the, the old, you know, black on white, boring story, make the story really interesting. Now, the last slide I want to share with you is that those are the results we've had for the year end of 2016. And all these tools that I've presented to you, they're, they're, they're catching people's imagination. Um, you know, we've had, 1.8 million, and that's from between uh, Jan uh, 2012 and 2016. We've had 1.8 million visitors on our site. They've read 3.5 million page pages. They've viewed 3.5 million pages. We've had 100,000 lesson plans downloaded by professionals. Uh, we've distributed close to over 900,000 of those postcards. And when I say we, I don't mean us. We active for life don't distribute postcards to parents, but what we do is we give them to organizations and they distribute them to parents. And uh, we've had over 500,000 activities for kids and toddlers viewed on our website. So the message there is that parents are interested, they want this stuff, and they're looking to you, all the organizations across the country, to be the point of contact, the point of gathering, to actually make physical literacy and quality sport the new normal. So thanks. Um, that was my presentation. I'll give back to you, Tyler, or who's next? Thanks, Tyler. Uh, I'm uh, just flipping back slides now. Richard, many thanks for that. Uh, that was brilliant. I think just uh, what a great combination of um, just opportunities really to see options you know there's there's no one right way to be tackling this and I think part of that is finding a way that works and there are so many different resources and I know sometimes having that many resources can almost um, account for some paralysis that there's so much choice out there you wonder where to go and I think it's that investment around knowing knowing your audience and uh, and starting from that point with this approach of, of valuing that, that parent-child relationship and how can the sport world, how can the physical literacy world support that in action. So I am uh, so grateful uh, to everybody's participation today. The questions and comments, I've just been scrolling through those uh, during Richard's presentation, marvelous input. Um, and again, I'm, I'm so glad we can capture that. So when Tyler creates this in the finishing notes, it really gives a, um, a proper bookend to the contribution to this webinar. So again, thanks to Leah. She's uh, um, actually probably motoring on her way to, a, to another 
uh, meeting right now. So Leah, thanks to you. Uh, Richard, thank you as always for your continued diligence uh, on behalf of Active for Life and providing Canadians, and it sounds like many others outside of Canada, uh, very valuable and, uh, and useful resources. So Tyler, I'm going to um, let you tidy up with any logistics about the session today as well as upcoming webinars, as well as any other kinds of questions, of course. Sure, thanks Vicki. So we've got uh, just over 10 minutes left, so why don't we open it up and if anybody's got any other questions that came about from Richard's presentation or from the presentation earlier, uh, please feel free to type, type them in the questions box and we can answer them now. And of course, if, uh, if you come up with a question after the recording is done, you can feel free to send them to myself. My email is Tyler, T-Y-L-E-R, at sportforlife.ca. And uh, we can make sure that we address those and send them back to you afterwards as well. And while some of those questions, uh, again, during Richard's presentation, I was trying to respond back to some of those very important questions. Um, those of you that asked some of those pointed questions, I'm hoping that they were showing up for you. And if they didn't hit the spot, um, if you've got a wee bit of time right now, please uh, let's continue the conversation. And just to extend on Tyler's invitation to continue asking questions, if you do uh, float further questions to Tyler's way, um, we do have a, that team approach of, um, of getting the best possible answer back to you. Great. There's a question here. Does the U of SAS Dream Team Project have a website, Vicki? No, it doesn't. Um, this has been a research project under the leadership of Louise Humbert, and I could follow up with Louise. She presented some of this early findings. In fact, the, the information I shared with you today was from a parent engagement uh, webinar that she shared with one of our long-term athlete development lunches here in Alberta back in... Gosh, I think it was just before Christmas, if I'm not mistaken. And so I can, I'll promise to follow up with Louise and just get any further updates that maybe we can create a link on follow-up material. That's a, a great question, though. Um, Louise is a, a gem and doing some very critical work in, uh, in different communities. Great. And Louise actually just uh, commented she is happy to share the findings. So thank you very much, Louise, for that. Oh, Louise is on? Oh, yep. yippee! Hi, Louise. <laughs> okay, great. So just a couple of other questions here. Um, but just to clarify about the recorded version of this presentation, so there's going to be a follow-up email that everybody's going to receive. It will have a, a link to the recording of this as well as a PDF of the presentation, both Richard's presentation and the pre presentation done by Leah and Vicky. I will also compile the questions uh, and the comments that were put in there in response to Vicky's questions earlier on. So all of that will be provided for you uh, in an email that should um, come out after the recording is done in a couple of days' time. Question for you, Richard. Could you clarify where we can find the postcards on Active for Life's website? Uh, yeah, just a second. I want to make sure. Sorry. Uh, am I muted? No, okay, I'm on. So when, when you go to Active for Life, if you go um, at the top of the page, you'll see in our tabs, you'll see um, at the, um, the extreme right, let me just open up the uh, website to give you the exact place, you'll see something called Pro Resources. And under Pro Resources, you'll see Grow Your Program. So in that section, Grow Your Program, you will see a, uh, a portion of that section dedicated. <coughs> oh, I am now we're going to see I, my great. Yeah, I just, I just flipped it back to you, Richard. There you go. Thank you very much. So if you look at the tab at the top of Active for Life, under Pro Resources, you've got Grow Your Program. And uh, there you'll see the first uh, element there is po postcard for parents. And you also uh, can basically order postcards. It'll pop up an email specific that will come directly to the person in charge. There you go. Very simple. Good. 
That's awesome. Okay. Are you still on my screen? I am. I'm just going to flip it back to okay. me. There awesome. we go. Now I love you. Technology works. Yeah, I know. I know. Just so that everybody knows, when the recording is shared with you in the follow-up email, it will be a link to the back end of GoTo where you can access it. That link will be live for a year, so you can access that recording. If you want to share that link with anybody else who wasn't a part of the webinar, they can access it as well. They'll just have to log in to GoTo the way that you did when you registered for this webinar in the first place. So uh, it doesn't matter if they attended or not, they'll be able to access it afterwards as well. So please feel free to share widely. Thank you. Okay, great. And it looks like that might be it for the questions. So thanks again very much to everybody for attending. Thank you again to Vicki, Leah, Richard, and Lynn. And I uh, hope everybody has a good rest of the day. Thanks, Tyler. Thank Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Tyler, are you are you still on? Yeah, so I'm just going to shut this down now, and we can uh, we can catch up afterwards.